Welcome to this tonight, episode 26 of the South African Equestrian Federation's podcast from the horse's mouth. My name is Georgie Roberts and tonight I'm very excited to be speaking to James White of Steed Equine Services, is that correct? Steed Equine Express. Equine Express. Um, it certainly sounds like one of the fastest ways to get your horse across the world. Speaking to him tonight about flying your horse. All the protocols around import and export from South Africa to the rest of the world with horses, something that's gained a lot of traction in the last few years. James, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me. I want to remind everyone who is listening that if you have any questions for James, please to pop them down in the comments section for us so that we can ask them of him. So, James, how did you get involved with this? So, my wife, obviously, as you know, is in the insurance business, and she was getting a lot of comments from clients bringing horses that they just weren't happy with the services that they were getting. So, took a deep dive into it, went a trip overseas, looked into getting everything done, and set up the business and started from there. You make that sound very easy. We know it's not. No, it wasn't that easy. It was a, a big risk to take. Mm. Um, luckily, there's not a lot of major investment in the business. You don't need to buy planes and pallets and things like that. So it really is just setting it up, um, registering the business and all of that, and uh, then getting the clients. I think it's very administration heavy, though. It's a lot and of administration. Go it's a lot of um, time behind the PC. Um, but Something you... horse people aren't really no, definitely not. <laughs> interested in. Um, so, James, and have you yourself brought in a horse for yourself? Um, I no. haven't brought in anything for myself. That's no. probably a wise decision. So I was, I out of interest, was um, involved at the Mauritian quarantine facility a few years ago. So I was vaguely aware of kind of what happened with the horses. But it's just the most complex thing. So how do you want to, do you want to discuss what the protocols would be if somebody wanted to import a horse? How they would start? Okay. Assuming so, they found a horse that they liked and is sound and, you know. Okay, so obviously that's the... First thing that you do is um, most people will obviously head off overseas with their coaches, look for the horse, um, set up the five or six of their top horses that they want to do and put the, the best ones through the vetting. And then it's a case of first thing we need to do is get a payment done. Um, there are some clients that are lucky enough that have the facilities and the ability in, to make those payments. Making Forex payments from South Africa is not the easiest thing. You need an export code. You need um, to, all the right reasons in which to do it. Some banks will let you do it. Not a lot of the banks will let you do it unless you have all of the right paperwork in place. It's quite a starting stumbling block so, to have. I yeah. haven't thought about it. Okay. Um, so that's the first stumbling block that most clients come across mm. is they've now got this horse and they can't pay for it. And mm. then the seller on the other end gets a little bit frustrated because the money's taking way too long mm. to come. So first point of call is we start with a payment for the horse. Then it's obviously looking to see what quarantine it will fit into. We generally ship horses in roughly every seven weeks. Um, and then we need to get the horses collected from wherever they are, sent to the quarantine station. And what quarantine facilities do you work through mostly, like from Europe, for example? So mostly from Holland. I like Holland because I've had a very good relationship with them over the last 12 years. They're close to the airport, which cuts down on your travel time from when you actually load them in the box to get to the airport for the time that they fly. They've got to be at the airport five hours before the actual flight. Um, so if you're having them further away than that, you're adding long to the day. travel time. It's a long time. And then you've got a 10 and a half hour flight from um, Holland to South Africa. Okay. So they start off at the quarantine facility. What happens before they're accepted at the quarantine facility? So generally, there's not much that needs to be done in order for them to ex uh, be accepted into the quarantine facility. There's very few diseases that horses will test positive for. It's a good idea to have your horses be tested for diseases such as CEM that means that they're not currently showing a, an infection. Um, stallions can only come in if they're EVA positive. If you can prove that they're positive from a vaccine, it becomes very, very difficult to bring an EVA positive okay. stallion in. Um, they have to have been vaccinated under quarantine conditions, so they actually need to have gone through a quarantine and been uh, tested negative for EVA and then vaccinated, vaccinated for EVA, and you have to have all of that proof. And most of the guys in Europe don't do it like that because it just takes way too much time. Okay. Okay, so they've so so not so many bloods to do as when you're sending a horse out. They go into quarantine, and how long do they have to stand in quarantine before coming onto so a plane? It's a minimum of 30 days in the quarantine oh, station. That's quite long. Um, they need to be have completed that 30 days by the time the health certificate is signed. So we, it's normally a Saturday or a Sunday flight, so they're normally there for 31 or 32 days because when a state vet or the ministry vet, as they call them in the EU, come out to sign the papers, um, they need to have completed that 30 days already. So they're normally looking at 31 to 30, 32 days quarantine. 
Sometimes they're there at the quarantine station for a little longer. That depends on the seller. Sometimes the seller wants the horse gone as soon as it's paid for, in which case it needs to be collected and okay. taken somewhere as quickly as possible. So but generally it's about 31, 32 days that they're okay. going to stay in quarantine. Fair enough. I did hear about, um, there was a stallion, donkey boy, I don't know if you heard about that, who was standing in transit at someone and had a, has had a career-ending injury. No, and no, no. they've, well, this is a point that they've said, is like once, once transfer has taken place, no one wants to take responsibility. And this, horses are just nightmares. Okay, so at the quarantine facility, how do things like, is there any way of monitoring their food, their exercise, their feet? How do, how do those management protocols work? So um, the food, obviously, we can get the information from the sellers. We try and get as much information about the horses as possible from the sellers when we pick them up, either the sellers or the new owners. Um, obviously, we need to know if the horse is claustrophobic, who it can stand next to. Um, we try and match that up as much as possible when we put the horses into quarantine. So if we do have stallions traveling, they obviously travel three in a pallet. We'll try and have that stallion standing next to the gelding that we potentially wanted to fly with at quarantine. So that's one of the oh, things that we nice. need to look at. So that the horses had create relationships. 30 days to get used to the horse that it's not nice. going to stand next to as opposed to climbing into a box. Yeah. And then all of a sudden there's a new... Um, We've all had a bad flight with someone yeah. obnoxious next to us. So I, I um, respect that. So uh, the quarantine station that we use is very, very good in, in the Netherlands. Um, they're very good with... Um, accommodating us with our feed requirements. So a few horses we've had to bring in special food for them. Um, their haylage is excellent. Um, farriers, it's not always that easy to get a farrier in. You can be talking about asking a farrier to come in and do 20, 30 extra horses that aren't on his regular cycle mm. um, within a time that he doesn't always have uh, the ability mm. to get there. So we try and get them done before they leave their, okay. their current yard. Um, and then there's a ferry on standby when they get over here that they're normally done within a week, uh, the first week of them arriving, um, that their feet are done. Exercise, uh, there's a walker and paddocks for them to go into. So they're into the walker. Um, riding them is a little bit difficult uh, just with the restrictions of the quarantine. They're not really allowed to mix with other horses and things like that. So mm. it, it becomes quite hard. But the walker they're allowed into and the paddock they're allowed into so long as they don't mix with the other horses um, in that livery mm. barn. So the quarantine yard is completely separate to, mm. to the livery is there a Is there a better time of year to bring a, a European horse in, like coming from winter into our winter? Um, uh, so I think it's always easier for them to arrive in slightly cooler weather. Our summers can be a little bit brutal, um, especially if we haven't had um, a lot of rain to cool it, cool mm. it down. So I generally think this sort of time, um, May, June, is a nice time for them to land. Our winters aren't as bitterly cold as the European winters are. So it's not that bad for them to arrive here with, with, if we've got sort of 5 to 10 degree weather, nighttime maybe it drops down to minus yeah, 1. Yeah, we're all wearing, and, they, and they're coming in and thinking and it's summer probably. That's a nice time okay. for them. Um, so in terms of weather-wise, that's obviously nice for them. Or sickness time is obviously a lot better for them to come in that sort of time as okay. well. Um, but it's obviously difficult depending on when, when you buy your horse. <laughs> totally. Yeah, yeah it, it, like love doesn't have a timeline on it, does it? Um, for the flights, for the horses coming in. So now you discussed how they're tracked to the airport and at the airport are they sorted onto, you speak about pallets. Would you explain briefly what the pallets are and what they look like? Okay, so pallet, basically, if you can think of a three-birth horse box, chop the wheels off, that's <laughs> what a pallet is. Um, so a pallet takes three horses. It's the most cost-effective way to fly horses. You pay for the pallet, you pay for the volume space that that takes up in the aircraft. So that's the most expensive part. So whether you're shipping a Shire or a Shetland? It doesn't okay. matter. You're going to pay the same thing for that pallet. So. All I hear you telling me is that the baggage weight things at airports are bullshit. That's <laughs> correct. Okay. Good to hear. Um, okay. Yeah. So chop the wheels off a of three berth. They're loaded into that. Um, Obviously, we've got a lot of horses that need to be loaded into the plane. The plane needs to be weighed, or the, the cargo needs to be weighed, and a, a balance sheet brought out. So you can't have all the heavy stuff right in the front of the plane, okay. otherwise it's not going to take off. So they then, uh, they then put a, a loading plan together for the plane um, and make sure that the plane is well balanced enough that it's going to fly well through the air. And how many horses would typically fly at a time on one of those planes? So that obviously depends on the supply and demand. Um, What's the most that could go? A plane can take 90 plus horses. The Jeez. quarantine in Joburg can only take just under 60. Okay. So That's a good limitation <laughs> to have then. Um, yeah. I mean, if you're talking some of the polo guys, if you're talking between Argentina and Europe, they will sometimes load 90 horses onto a plane. Wow. 
And then is there other cargo going on? Generally not on oh, that okay. plane. It's not okay. other cargo, but on our flights uh, from Europe to South Africa, there's other cargo on the plane. Okay. So we've had the guys sitting next to Porsches and Ferraris. And, wow, really? Yeah. That's interesting. No, and obviously not wanting us to get loose on that. That would be... No, definitely not. So um, something that I think does come up is people wanting to bandage or blanket their horses for these flights. Will you talk about that a little bit? Okay, so bandaging and blanketing. Um, obviously, we've talked about the pallet that they now go into. So it's although it's open in the front, there's a little gap at the top in the front and a gap at the, at the back. Um, it does get hot inside there. So they'll generally have the air conditioning turned right down to probably about 12 or 15 degrees in the plane in order to keep the horses cool enough. So you really, really don't need to put a blanket on your horse. And it's just something that can cause a problem if it comes loose, slips down. Um, again, if you can imagine your three horse box and now the back bandages have come loose, cannot get in get there, in there. Oh. to fix them. So there's potential that that horse is now going to kick for the next 10 and a half plus hours solidly against the back mm. over there and there's absolutely nothing that the groom could do there is not mm. there's no room for them to get in there some clients want their horses to travel with front trucking boots at least that is an option because you can at least adjust those if they do slip or fall mm. off or irritate the horse um, but again it stops you just adding mm. a layer of heat to your horse yeah. that they don't really need yeah and he says one of the things that's been cited as being most detrimental to leg health or, you know so i think that's quite a valid thing um, how do you how do you do you feed and water the horses while they're on that ten hour flight? Uh, so there's no hard food, but they obviously have grass um, and water. They are offered water on a regular basis. We have the professional grooms that fly with them, um, and they're offered food. Uh, they offer the the water on a regular basis, and then they've got grass nonstop. They've got grass all the time. Very important for them when they're taking off. We have the best grass for them there, stuff called haylage, because oh, um, you want yeah. them chewing. Exactly the same reason you'll stick a piece of bubble gum in your mouth to chew as you take yeah. off on the plane. It just helps them pop their ears. That's um, amazing. That's interesting. That that that's yeah. just something you would not think of. You speak about your professional grooms, and I think this is quite an important part about having the right yeah. people to travel with them. What's, what are their duties? You've, you've mentioned that, like, you know, having to give them water, but it goes obviously far beyond that in a bad situation. Yeah. So, I mean, these are professional grooms. It's what they do for a living. They earn their money from it. I mean, you're talking about guys that are flying with the Olympic level horses. They're flying all the time, once a week. These guys go through the extra thick passports in less than six months. Oh. They fly on a regular basis. It's a pretty cool job um, to have. So they're obviously monitoring your horse. They're monitoring the horses for signs of anything um, Anxiety is probably the number one that they're looking for, that they can sedate them before they get uptight. Um, having horse freak out on a plane mid-air is not something mm. that you want. Again, there's very little that you can do once they're up there, but you're looking to catch those things before they start to happen. Mm. Obviously, monitoring for other sorts of signs and things like that. So that um, signs of colic, they can give us the band and penadine. Um, and obviously, well, they're obviously specially licensed to carry those drugs. So they are allowed to carry this. this. One obviously normally wouldn't be allowed to carry these open syringes and things like that. True. Um, onto a plane. Onto a plane. But they get special permission to carry it. Um, not every flight would have a vet on, but there are some flights that have vets. Um, we've got a vet that um, flies occasionally between Europe and South Africa. And they're actually a very good vet that comes from Argentina. Uh, between That's Argentina cool. and Europe. He's flown once for me between from Argentina to Europe and down um, with some horses. Um, and quite amazed once he managed to, it wasn't one of our flights here, but a flight between Argentina and I think it was Europe, if I'm not mistaken. Um, he managed to do a full stitch up on a horse's face that had basically done a full peel um, of its head. It had a bit of a panic attack and um, managed to stitch the horse up mid flight. The horse landed. Is that like it gives a man a bulb no, and that's really, just, that's next level, yeah, yeah. but that's great. So one of the things, oh, so I wanted to ask about the sedation. I know I've heard that there's a point if you do wait too long, that the sedation is very hard to actually affect. Yeah. So, so you'd rather be preemptive. Yeah. So like with anything, once that adrenaline is kicked in, the sedation doesn't do much, uh, whether the horse is in the plane or on the ground, um, or you have to give a hell of a lot. No. And okay. if you're giving a hell of a lot at altitude, it's also not that great. So you'd rather want to get it a little bit full, a little bit before they freak out. So you really are looking at signs for them. If they're getting a little bit anxious, if they're getting a little bit nervous, um, so the grooms will take it in shifts, they'll go down. Nice. Even though, let's say, I've got maybe 12 horses on the plane, so I've got four pellets, one of the other agents has got their 12, and maybe there's another agent. The grooms, even though they're 
got their specific horses that they're assigned to, they'll go down and give it rotating shifts. So every hour there's probably a groom that's going nice. out taking a walk. Because it's listening. also mutual. Um, you know, none of us want to be on a plane with a freaking out horse. So <sighs> Look, also I think we're all horse people at the end of the day and no one wants to see a horse injured. We keep talking about the golden thread in every podcast that comes out, that the one unifying thing, as much as we might fight or whatever the case is, we all love horses, Yeah, hopefully. Um, travel sickness. The travel so will sickness. you tell us a little bit about it first in case people aren't familiar with it? Okay, so travel sickness, it's a, it's a disease that everyone hates. <laughs> um, it's from them not really being able to get excess mucus out of their... Um, track here and it ends up going down so it, it's like a form of pneumonia that's probably the easiest way, easiest way that most people can put it and it can be fatal to horses um it's something that we look for a lot and credit to jean villiers from four ways equine she's um managed to get this completely under wraps um when i started shipping horses if there was a sign of travel sickness they were sent off to op and they spent the rest of their quarantine at op honest oh. word um it's jean treats it aggressively if there is any signs of it she'd rather treat the horse early and aggressively mm. than wait for it to get too bad um well considering that you could be losing the horse you've yeah. just imported correct i think that's a great protocol yeah so once the horses have arrived we temp check them on a uh, quite often karen our um quarantine manager that looks after the horses over there she's there for a good few hours after the horses have landed um walking around checking the horses um just checking to see that they're eating that they've drunk that they're not standing in an absolute sweat and looking miserable and things like that so um and then obviously we we'll tempt them so once they're settled probably about half an hour to an hour after they've landed the grooms will go around and take their temperatures which a lot of the time also isn't always easy um, especially when you're buying young horses and they're not handled from europe which happens a lot um so very affordable um demographic that that's your yeah so temperature checking and then obviously just the horse's general well-being and what they're looking at and any sort of sign of that and they're hit with gentle penicillin and um, antibiotics and hit hard That's and generally good recovery within a few days. Okay. So worst case scenario though, that can be a fatal disease. Worst case oh, scenario course. can be a fatal disease, but as I say, all credit to Dr. Jean de Villiers, Fantastic. she's got it under wraps and um, yeah. You speak about the 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 wheelless horse box as the 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 pallet that you use. Are there other kinds of pallets that are still being used? Uh, generally not. They're generally all those sort of pallets. Um, I spoke about the polo ponies earlier. Um, one other way of loading horses, and I believe, if I'm not mistaken, when Graham Wynn took horses out of here to go to his Wig. eventing oh. champs in Wig, you actually walk the horse up onto the plane oh and you God. build the pallet around the horse. Wow um so that's one way of doing it um and then there's an what they call an open top pallet so the pallet that that we use they're closed tops mm. and then you get an open top pallet so again same sort of size uh, but there's no roof and you'll often end up with a strap or a, a neck strap that ties mm. the horse down to stop them from being able to jump up and get out once they're in the plane the top of the plane um forms that ceiling. I was actually quite interested. I, I was doing a bit of Googling to prepare to speak to you, just looking for images. And it's not that roomy. It's the same as a normal plane where you could basically reach up and touch the ceiling. Yeah. It's I picture there being a lot more space, but that's probably better yeah. that there isn't. Um, are there different kinds of planes that you fly on? Are they always cargo planes, always pretty similar? Pretty much always cargo planes. Uh, KLM used to offer what they called a combi, uh, not to South Africa, but between the USA and Europe, where um, it was combination planes. So there was the passengers and the horses below. Um, and I remember my agent uh, from Germany telling me that the guys on the plane used to get very confused when Name. people used to walk up from the back of the plane up and covered in grass because they've just been <laughs> feeding lovely. the horses and they take their seat for a little while um, and occasionally the neigh of a horse or something yeah. on their plane. That's fun. That's great. Um, can we talk a little bit about the protocol for taking a horse out? Oh, sorry. And then they land. How long are they in quarantine in South Africa? So landing you? in South Africa, they're in quarantine for another minimum of 30, 30 days quarantine. It, again, it's normally about 30, 31 days. Uh, this first day of quarantine is counted as the day after all the horses have arrived. Okay. So if they all all land by the Sunday, Monday is day one of quarantine, and then it's 30 days okay. from there. Um, are they retested again for the diseases? They are they retested need? exactly the same as they were tested overseas. All the tests are redone, so they're tested again for yeah, pretty much everything. And 
a silly question, but I know things have changed dramatically in the last 15 years. How do you know that the horse you bought is the horse that you're getting? So obviously um, microchips have come in a lot. So microchips. Um, no more bump stickers because that no, was the No, no more bump stickers. Yeah. Um, so they are obviously scanned when they arrive at quarantine. We have a copy of their passport. Um, microchip numbers are all uh, tested. The copy of the passport is sent to the quarantine station even before the horses arrive. They need a list of all the horses that are coming. So we get a copy of the passport from the client or the seller of the horse. Um, that's obviously got the microchip number. And then they are scanned on arrival at the quarantine station, scanned before leaving, scanned on arrival in South Africa, and scanned before leaving in um, South Africa. Microchip and pays for itself. Microchip pays for that. A um, couple of years ago, I bought I bought in one horse. I think the other agent could have been, uh, I'm not sure who it was. Um, we had full sisters. Two greys looked exactly alike. No. Full sisters. Um, and both coming to Kailami. So we made sure that the right was crossed. Was gonna, that must have been a little bit right of a nerve-wracking <laughs> moment. And then just like maybe pop in and check them a, a week later. Just saying hi, you know. Um, okay, so so people, it's a month, the flight, and then another um, month minimum. Yeah. What could what could potentially disrupt that month long quarantine? Okay, so any any test that needs to be redone. Um, a little bit of a sore story. There are positive results that do come through. Um, they are generally negative uh, or, or false positives. Um, the question is whether or not you can get that horse to then give you a negative result, and those are the delays that can potentially come along. When I first started this, we used to get a lot of issues with the EVA. As I said to you in the beginning, the horse has to, uh, mares and geldings can come in if they're EVA positive, but those tests, the, the titer needs to be stable. They consider a stable titer the second result not being more than double the first result so okay. they can test let's call it 100 on the first result they can test up to 200 on the second result 201 and they failed they failed that test sure. okay um what we figured they were doing in south africa um they were comparing the south african tests to the european tests which was giving them different results because it's different labs uh we eventually oh, i didn't even think that there was a lab variation it took us a long time to sure. figure it out um, we eventually figured it out through a horse that I had um, that we were t that we had issues with. It was a stallion that came into quarantine. It was positive on EVA, um, and we ended up having to gold that stallion. And we were testing it on a regular basis to see what uh, to make sure that we mm. have a, had a stable titer. And his titer fluctuated and fluctuated really a hell of a lot. Um, the lab technicians there in Europe said to us, "What we needed to do was do a paired sample." collect one result or, or one set of bloods, 21 days later, collect a second set of bloods, run those two bloods in the lab at the same time under the same conditions. Oh, and that's we, and really got a stable interesting. Um, and I didn't know that. That's we, fascinating what you would, you know, have to learn. Our biggest delays when I first started this was EVA and exactly the same thing. They were collecting the bloods, running them, 21 days later, collecting okay. the bloods, running them. And we were having issues with varied results, and then they were comparing them to the, to the European results. Varied results changed it to a stable title. We haven't had, uh, to a, a paired testing. We haven't had a single issue with. That's that actually system. crazy. I didn't think that there could be such a, a variation in, yeah. in in a lab. You know, you think that's so and stable. Apparently, according to the technician that we spoke at at the Dutch lab, they said a, deg a, a degrees difference in the lab oh, can that's... can change the results. Sure, that's really that's. I mean, frightening, amazing, yeah. but, you know, concerning. Um, when the horses arrive here, and we'll, we're going to talk about um, the, the positive tests that we have had lately, a little bit later, when is the horse sickness vaccine? Because obviously the horse sickness vaccine cannot be given while they're in Europe. Correct. So it's a live virus, so you can't give it to them in Europe. Um, <clears throat> it used to be given relatively soon after they arrived. Um, Jean prefers to wait a week after they've arrived. And the reason she wants to wait a, a week, you're injecting a horse, horse with a live virus. If they've got any bit of travel sickness or anything like that, any, any illness that could potentially <laughs> compromise them once you've given them the African horse sickness vaccine, she doesn't want to get them sicker than what they need to be. So she'll wait a week, make sure that they're 100% healthy, they're not carrying a little bit of um, illness from the flight. And then generally within a week, they've been given their first vaccine and then just before they come out normally if they normally come out on a wednesday normally on the monday they've had their second horse sickness vaccine and how do you find horses coming into the country acclimatize like what, what should owners just bear in mind every horse is obviously very different but 
should they be giving them a little bit of time to acclimatize? Should they be giving them a second round of horse sickness vaccines as soon as possible? What's your recommendation? So, look, horse sickness, the, the, the case studies has always been the more they've had the vaccine, the stronger their immunity. So for most of my clients, I'd recommend if they've landed um, to give them a little bit of a breather, put them into, uh, so they've come out of quarantine, you can put them into a light, light work, work them lightly for a month, um, then give them another round of uh, African horse sickness. So they'll be off for a little over three weeks um, and then bring them back into work again. Um, in terms of how they acclimatize, obviously their, their coat. So if they're coming from a summer condition over there, they've got their summer coat. Um, so normally in our winter, they've got their summer coat, but come summer, they'll often throw a winter coat. So I prefer not to clip them. I think they acclimatize a little bit better unclipped. Um, but that obviously also depends on the horse's health as well mm. and how much of a winter coat they've got, mm. how hot the summer is. Um, so I prefer to not, not clip them. And generally within one season, uh, they will have acclimatized. So one, within a year, they've acclimatized and they've got... So fast bait for one year. Fast bait for it's one great. year. I, I've been told by um, some of the top riders that I import for, the mares tend to take a little bit longer to acclimatize. So they'll often say to me, it's taken them a year to get the horse that they tried in Europe. So I don't know if that's a cycling thing yeah, with their hormones probably. and things like that. Goldings, I think, are a little bit, um, they haven't got hormones to contend with, mm -hmm. so a little bit easier for them to acclimatize. And I would imagine the same probably goes for a stallion. They've come from a breeding season in Europe into a breeding season in South Africa. Um, all the or they're are... coming into the longest dry spell of their lives. Correct. Good boys. Yeah. Okay. Um, so generally, it takes give, give them a year to acclimatize. Um, let them get used to everything. Generally, what's the rush? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like saying buying a Ferrari and leaving it in the garage for a year. Um, but generally, you'll get a little bit more life out of your horse. They'll last a little bit, lo little bit longer. And it's not to say that you can't do anything. That's Let lovely. them work. Go to the odd mm. little show, but don't be going to – don't land them tomorrow and World Cup next week, uh, next week and every World Cup for the rest of, this, uh, oh. rest of the year. Um, it is hard. Like you say, have, you have this Ferrari and now it's sitting in the garage. Shame. Um, I just want to check if we've had any questions. What is the – oh, Julie Burdus says, what is protocol for stallions traveling? Um, so, Julie, we have discussed the, the EVA, CEM. Yeah. Um, protocol, so I need a little bit more – so all horses are tested the same. I'm going to – let's say I'm assuming it's uh, regarding to test. So all horses are tested the same. Mares, Golding, Stallions, they all go through the same, same testing. Uh, protocol in terms of flying, uh, obviously we want to have them next to Goldings and not next to two mares. Um, the actual pallet they go into, that they go into has got a sniffer board, which you can pull out so that they can't smell the horses next to them. But generally, as I said to you in the beginning, we try and acclimatize them to the horse that we want That's them nice. to ideally travel next to, that they're not isolated for the whole of the flight. They're social beings at the end of the day. Do you find, I know this is hotly de debated, do you find putting Vicks in a stallion's nose will help them to... So most of the guys will travel with something to put in their nose. It's, it can help. Um, but generally, as I say, if we can acclimatize them to that horse that they are going to travel next to, we generally don't have issues. It's not often that the sniffer board is out for the entire flight. Most of the time we are, we do, are able to pull it back and let them mm -hmm. chat to their, to their neighbors. Oh, they like to be the social. Flight. They like Shame. to be social. Um, okay. So for, for regards to coming in, all imports have you only done from europe generally we don't really bring in horses from the states and... um so i have done from the states um there is currently a ban on horses coming in from the states directly to south africa um it's not necessarily a direct flight they used to fly from uh from the states to europe would stop over there normally one or two days at the amstel hotel um in uh, at the airport mm -hmm. and then they'd catch the same flight that our european horses okay. would come to south africa we normally try and have one or two days in between one for rest and two for delays you know oh, you don't want that. to miss your connecting no, flight no no that would suck <laughs> okay that would be terrible um and especially if we are lining that horse up with another horse that it's going to fly with in the pallet oh you must to get south to know africa. us um, they won't get to meet until they get to the airport, mm. until they load into the pallets, because it's completely separate. They need to be isolated oh, from course. the other okay. horses. They haven't 
the horses in Europe might not have completed their quarantine yet, in which okay. case they are not of the same health status. So this is, this, the admin that is behind this is just crazy. And if, if, for example, something did happen there, that would not nullify the entire city. Like I'm just saying, if you chucked a new horse into the stables, the 30-day quarantine would have to start again. Yeah, so if someone mistakenly puts a horse into the quarantine station that hasn't got any tests, have to start from scratch. And the other, the people going in and out of the quarantine facility, is that very closely monitored as well? Or is it a little bit more lenient? It's a little bit more lenient than it is over here. It's an isolation more than a quarantine in Europe. They are okay. isolated from the other horses. So there aren't really diseases that people can carry. Okay. Um, the one that we would be potentially worried about, although it's not a disease that we test for, would be strangles. It's one that's fairly easy to, mm. to move around. But none of the diseases that we're testing for can be transmitted by humans. With the exception of the horse sickness vaccine, all the other vaccines that we use are available internationally as well, right? Correct, yeah. Okay. So the flu is of the same same okay. uh, type, um, and those are the only real vaccines. Um, they need to be up to date with the flu. Okay. So why are American horses not allowed to come here? Um, there was a, a, a breakdown in communications. Okay. So South Africa updated their policies and their testing schedule, and there was a, a, America just never agreed to it. Oh, okay. So, so bureaucracy at play. Okay. Yeah. So now in order to bring a horse in from America, you have to ship it from America to Holland sure. or, to, or to Europe, complete your 30-day quarantine in Europe, and then bring it in. So it becomes a fair bit more costly. Much more expensive. There is also a little bit of um, quarantine and that between uh, America and Europe that does become a fair bit oh, more okay. costly, which puts a lot of people off. Um, we've shipped horses from Argentina as well before. Um, so that's quarantine. That's a... Hell of a long flight for the horses as well. Oh, how long is it? Um, I have to go back in my records to check. I'm not sure. That's but really... It's, it's probably a two-day flight by the time. Comes. Two days. Yeah. It's, horses. It's, it's a long flight. They fly up from Argentina up to... It's around Florida, then from Florida up to... Across to Amsterdam, from then from Amsterdam down to here. So again, and they stay on the plane the entire time. They, if I'm not mistaken, they switch planes in Florida. So okay. They've got to stop over in Florida where they refuel. Uh, it's Florida there or thereabouts. I'm not exactly sure where, that, where it is. I can't remember. We don't, I've done two flights from Argentina. And then, um, and again, admin, you want them to leave about a week before their connecting flight to <laughs> Amsterdam. Okay. Making sure that they don't Making miss sure if, if there's a one-day delay leaving Argentina, um, then you potentially, there's a delay leaving Florida, that can already put you onto a three-day delay. So if you've only bargained two days or one day from them arriving in Amsterdam to your trip oh. down, and you've missed it by 10, no, out, 10 I mean, hours. I, just, I can't, I can't. That would just, yeah. And I suppose, and, yeah, and then the clients, you know, would be an interesting thing of liability, I suppose. Uh, you know, does that fall with you, or I suppose it's on a case-by-case -case basis? <sighs> So it's all, unfortunately, at the client's risk. Obviously, the airline is responsible for a certain amount. If there's something that was on them that could have been avoided um, and it's um, something that they, they've done, uh, but unfortunately, the risk is with the client. Um, besides Argentina, America, Europe, and, they, and someone, the SA Percheron Society says, from which countries in Europe do you import horses currently? So, as I said to you, the quarantine is um, all done. We, I prefer to do it in um, Holland. You can quarantine in Belgium, but the horses come from all over. So, I've brought in horses from Spain, Portugal, Germany, Czechoslovakia, um, Hungary, France, Belgium, Holland, obviously Dutch horses, uh, horses from Ireland, horses from UK. I think recently we had one from Sweden as well. That's so great. Um, I've probably covered most of Dubai and um, Australia. We had. I know that we used to have thoroughbreds, young thoroughbreds coming from yeah. Australia. And so the thoroughbred um, guys used to shop a fair amount in Australia. Obviously, on the yearling sales, they would um, go and shop. They used to bring in roughly 40, 40 horses at a time, so it was a fair amount <clears throat> of yearlings. That's horrifying. Of yearlings. Um, yeah, it is fairly horrifying. <laughs> um, I think the rand dollar exchange rate has played a huge part in, in stopping that. that. Uh, hasn't had um, okay. thoroughbreds from Australia for a long time. Um, Dubai, occasionally, not much. It is possible. It obviously depends on where you're looking for horses. Um, there needs to be a health agreement between the two countries. So there needs to be a health oh, agreement. That's it. So is that what we don't have with the States that's at the moment? That's what we don't have okay. with the States at the moment, and it's what we are currently going through with Europe at the moment is renegotiating those health 
the, the health agreements between. So before we talk about exporting a horse, do you want to talk about what's happened with our communication failure with Europe at the moment? Because I have to, I have bit. to be honest. Before I, I spoke to you a while ago, I had not even heard of Sura. Okay. It was nowhere on my. Someone said it, and I said, "What?" Yeah, it's it's a, and and funny enough, when you ask any of the vets over here, they'll tell you, "Sura, there's nothing you need, you need to know about it. Something that doesn't happen here." My vet said to me, when she went through vet school, they said, "This is Sura. This is what it looks like. That's all you need to know. You'll never get it." It's, I suppose this is the problem with importing horses across yeah. across so international. It, it is what boundaries. quarantine is for. Quarantine is there to uh, weed out potential disease and make sure that um, each country keeps its health status mm. um, free of certain diseases. So South Africa is free of sorrow. It's a sorrow free um, country. So going out to, uh, to other countries, we don't need to test for it. Uh, so what happened? We had a horse that um, landed in South Africa last year, roughly about this sort of time. And it showed what's called a weak reaction. Um, the tricky thing with Sarah is the test is actually visually inspected by a lab technician. So they'll run the test. In it the sounds incredibly <laughs> unobjective for something coming from a lab. But... So th this specific test, okay. uh, it's called a CAT method, CAT, card agglutination uh, method. And it's, there's room for error in it. So this particular horse showed a what they call a weak reaction. So you either have a, a negative reaction, um, you have a weak reaction, positive, uh, double positive or triple positive. So obviously the more positive you are, the more likely it is that you actually have a, a redder robot is yep. all I'm hearing. Okay. All right. So this particular horse on arrival um, had a weak positive. Um, now, according to the OIE, that's the World Organization for Animal Health, and according to our import permits, weak reactions need further testing and they will then run a more specific test so the, and the horse was negative on the other side obviously otherwise it wouldn't so have been allowed to fly the horse on the other side that um showed a weak reaction and the dutch did everything according to what the import permit and the world organization for animal health said they ran in an additional test and then sent the horse off on the, that additional test they ran they ran a more specific test which is exactly what the permit and the um uh, the OIE stipulates mm -hmm. should be done. So if I can put it in layman's term, uh, the CAT test, it's a broad spectrum test. It tests for antibodies of the trypanosoma disease. The most common so one that- durine. Uh, that's durine. Durine is a trypanosoma. Okay. I was gonna say the most common one that most people here would know is um, durine. We obviously, durine is part of our tests as well. Okay. So if they're negative for durine, it's obviously not that, but there's a list about this long of trypanosomes. Oh, okay. Um, so it as, could be any one of those. It could be any one of those. And as I said to you, um, got a little bit off tra track there. It's a disease that's tested visually by the lab technician. So he looks into his Petri dish. He's got a little card. Um, almost no black marks is obviously a, a negative. A few black marks, and it's a weak negative. Um, then you've got a weak positive with slightly fewer marks. And the, the darker and the more marks there are, mm -hmm. is the, the more it is. Now, your lab technician isn't going to go and sit and count them. Let's say the borderline is a thousand dots, and that's your difference between uh, negative and positive. He's not going to sit and count all those dots. He's going to work a little area, count his 20 dots in a little area, multiply that by the surface area, and maybe he gets to 1,001 little dots. Now it's a weak positive because he's over his margin of a thousand, okay. which is why the OIE says more specific test. So um, that was the first horse that came in. The horse obviously arrived in South Africa, had another weak reaction over here. It was tested again, had a weak reaction. And South Africa does not have the ability to run a more specific test. Oh, damn. So okay. They, so they couldn't okay. run anything else. Wow. Um, and what happens in that case? Do you have to destroy the horse? Do you have to? So their reaction was to either send the horse back to Europe or to destroy the horse. Um, we took them to court over the reasoning um, behind it, that the Dutch did everything according mm. to the permit um, and um, actually eventually ended up agreeing that we'd send the horse off to Kenya. That horse has subsequently tested negative on the CAT test in South Africa and is back in the country. Oh. That's how um, Fickle, subjective that, okay. test, that test yeah. is. Um, the very next shipment, a horse landed in the country, um, exactly the same thing, no. pr pretty much the same scenario, <laughs> no. had a positive reaction in Europe. Um, it, I believe it then had a negative reaction uh, or, or negative result, uh, flew on that, 
kept on getting a weak reaction over here. When I say positive, it was a weak reaction. It wasn't mm. a, a, a okay. strong positive. Um, I don't know if they ran any additional tests um, overseas. Uh, this time, uh, at the same time, also with the first lot, there was about five other horses that tested uh, with a weak reaction, um, but then subsequently tested sure. negative. Okay. Same with this one, the second shipment that came in. Um, there was about five horses that all tested with weak reactions or inconclusive results. Who who manages these tests? The South African state the vets? Support. Okay. And uh, is that the state vets? Or uh, no? so, uh, the state vets just looks at the results okay. and then makes the decisions from there, but Honest Report actually runs and manages okay. the tests. So with the state vet liaise with the uh, OIM? OIE. OIE, yeah. Okay. Um, they'll liaise with uh, OIE. Any, obviously, if there is a positive case, it needs to be reported to the OIE. Um, but there's no reason to liaise with them unless there is a, a real positive case. Okay. So it's further testing, basically, okay. is what they need to do. So is our government demanding better protocols from Europe? Or? Our government is currently demanding uh, better protocols from Europe. <laughs> Strangely enough, the protocols that were done with the second lot, which they refused to accept again. Oh, that's interesting. So the second horse that came in, they allowed us to send the bloods back to Europe for retesting. Um, we tested using two different methods. This particular horse, unfortunately, again, showed a weak reaction on the, the CAT method, uh, but showed a negative result using a more specific test, um, okay. which is, funny enough, the test that they now want us to use. Um, and is it a in. massive thing for us to it's not bring a, it in? It's not a massive thing for us to do those tests. It's very okay. simple and easy. The labs run them already. Um, and it should clear up any issues going forward. Great. And I believe there's also a system in process to get that more specific test available okay. to us in South Africa. So does that mean, so our horses allowed currently to come from Europe to South Africa? or is Curren that Currently not, but I believe that probably by latest middle of May we should be shipping. We've had some good news this week. Okay. Oh, that's um, great. And uh, I think it was Thursday just before Easter. I got it uh, while I was jumping at Easter Festival. Um, good news from Belgium and good news from, uh, that was from uh, just before Easter. And then good news from Netherlands this week that um, I don't think it'll be long before we can put horses back to quarantine. Fantastic. Yeah. That's good news. Um, okay, so horses leaving South Africa. So I think horse sickness obviously is the the big one here, and like you were saying, you know, um, Europe is a seropositive country, so the Europe protocols not are different. Oh, they're not. Country. They're not a seropositive country. Oh, so, so they would also they would be a topical disease. So um, that's interesting. Exactly the point and exactly the issue that we were trying oh, to have okay. with um, with our government, which they decided not to. Okay, not discuss. To. Um, and it's it's one of the reasons why the Dutch were so. Um, specific with their testing. Because they're not a seropositive country, they needed to make sure that if this is a positive horse or not. And so they're doing a better um, job of testing than the seropositive country. Sura is potentially more lethal than horse sickness. Oh, wow. Uh, okay. Horses can die with any, anywhere from within two weeks to four months. Is it spelled S-U-R-R-A? S-U-R-R-A. Okay, I'm yeah. going to have to go look up. Technical name is Trypanosoma ebonzi. Okay. And what's, what are the symptoms out of interest? Uh, massive weight loss um, and basically they just Okay. anemic and you end up euthanizing. Jeez, okay. Yeah. Um, so horses leaving South Africa, obviously South Africa is an endemic horse sickness country. Correct. And and it, I, I've seen that the Barcelona Olympics apparently were affected by horse sickness years ago. They've had outbreaks in other parts. So they're very, very strict about us not Correct. Yeah. So sending that out into the world again. Many, many years ago, um, Spain did have an outbreak of um, horse sickness. Um, and I'm going to think it was probably back in about 2019, maybe, yeah, maybe a little bit earlier. Um, Thailand had a massive, massive. And I was very this. interested to read about that. It had something to do with zebras. So there was somebody from here. I have no idea who or whatever. They um, obviously a zoo in Thailand bought the zebras, and the horses, uh, the zebras were um, shipped to Thailand, obviously with no testing or anything like that. Oh um, and it was devastating. It was oh, absolutely devastating. Really? The horses were dying left, right, and center. They obviously have the midges and the ability for the disease to be transmitted. Um, and now you've introduced horse sickness. Does to anywhere else in the world vaccinate against horse sickness? Uh, obviously our neighboring countries, Africa, oh. it's African horse sickness. Um, but in terms of Europe, they don't have the disease They have zero there. protection if um, there is Dubai an Dubai has done some trials on it using a vaccine that they have um, created. Um, and again, Europe has the, they have the midge, which is why Europe mm. is so scared to get it. Um, I mean, you can imagine 
No, the I mean, is, the, de- the, the density of horses in Europe, it would just, it yeah. would be a disaster. Um, so, so obviously horses leaving South Africa, that's the biggest concern of why our quarantine is so lengthy. Correct. Um, so the quarantine is not necessarily lengthy because of um, the African horse sickness itself. The problem and the reason our quarantine is so lengthy is we end up having to do two trades. It becomes a trade agreement between South Africa and Mauritius. That's your 21-day quarantine in South Africa to get to Mauritius. Then Europe will only do a trade agreement with Mauritian resident horses. And in order to become a Mauritian resident horse, you need to have completed 90 days in Mauritius. Therefore, they are So Mauritian. technically Europe doesn't want South African horses at all? Technically Europe doesn't want South African horses okay. at all at the moment. Okay. Um, and then you're, it's a 40-day quarantine from Mauritius onto Europe which is what our old quarantine no, was. It was okay. a 40-day quarantine in South Africa and then off to Europe. So the quarantine is it's not that long, um, but Europe will only accept a Mauritian resident horse. So 50, 50 days of your 90 days is uh, starting to become a resident and then wow. you complete the balance of that 90 days. I suppose it's, it's, it's two flights. It's more expensive. It's two it's... flights. It's more expensive. You're looking at probably... I haven't really don't I don't do any uh, shipments out by Mauritius. It's it's lengthy. I've looked at setting it up. It's expensive, um, and I just really didn't want to get into it. At that stage, it sounded like we were fairly close to opening again, and then we had another couple of cases of horse sickness in our um, surveillance and protected zone, um, and it went on for a little bit longer. But you're talking about putting in a couple of million rands worth of infrastructure onto somebody else's property mm. to potentially ship however many horses a year. And I, I remember we spoke to Prof. Sana, Ian Sana, obviously yes. the president of the SAEF, in one of, I think, our very first podcast. And he said potentially a, a, an effective vaccine, an effective testing could totally change that protocol. It would obviously have to get approved, and but, you know, then it could ship out again from Cape Town. Correct, yeah. So day. I don't think we're terribly far away from it. Um, the European Union has done an audit on um, our movement of horses, how we move horses um, from our infected zone into our free zone. Um, obviously what protocols we're taking and how it's being done and all of that. And the testing is more the um, thing that needs to get up to speed than the vaccine. Testing and all of that sort of stuff. The testing is accepted. That's been accepted um, by the European Union. So I'm hoping that at some stage this year, direct exports from South Africa to Europe will be wow, back on this track. Year. I'm hoping so. I think we're very, very close. And, and um, there's been a lot of work in terms of, um, and you'll know the reason that we are now uh, requested and in certain parts of the country required to vaccinate between July and October. Mm. Um, And it's because they'd figured out that um, what was happening in the protected and surveillance zones is that as horse sickness was moving down through the country, the guys there were getting a little bit scared, illegally vaccinating the horse during high midge period. Um, Mm. And the vaccine was then being transmitted from the, or the, or the virus was being transmitted from a vaccinated horse to neighboring properties, or that horse was showing signs of horse sickness. The guys uh, were getting the vets out. The vets were confirming that it was positive for horse sickness, but they were saying, I didn't vaccinate the horse. Because okay. it was not really But actually it was the vaccine. They were... So they were having either issues with the vaccine or neighboring horses were showing signs because um, you can then, trans. it's a live virus, you can then transmit that to a uh, it does also make you understand why, and again, this was covered in that first podcast, if I recall, they are trying to be so strict about vaccine protocols. Correct. Yeah, so in, in the Western Cape, you cannot vaccinate your horse um, anywhere outside of those months at all. Obviously, it's low midge uh, period, and it's much safer to vaccinate them at that time. High midge period, absolutely may not vaccinate your horses during that time, and obviously recommended for the rest of the country. The less we can spread it via midge, um, by the midges, obviously mm. they're better for everyone. And it's been touch wood a long time now since we've had any cases um, in that part of the country. That's great. Um, I believe I was interested to read that the United States is a pyro negative country, which means that they don't, they won't accept horses from South Africa that test positive for, for biliary. For pyro, correct, for biliary, yeah. And apparently biliary is something that you'll test positive for without being active correct so you don't need to be sick um so it's it, similar to the the during and the sura tests or the the titers is that... not not quite so uh 
Where is the SORA test is, as I said, it's subjective. You don't, you, you might not have SORA or have ever had SORA. And as I say, it's a deadly disease. And you could potentially still show a weak reaction. Um, with pyro, you could potentially um, transmit the disease if you are what they call it like a low, low carrier. Um, there's a little bit of it in your system. So they, again, they have the ticks, they have the, um, the vector, the vector, the ability to transmit mm -hmm. it. Uh, but they don't have the disease. So a tick could bite a pyropositive horse and Correct. then even, spread it even like Even though that horse may have never had uh, shown signs of biliary in its life. It's got um, antibodies, basically. Correct. Okay. At some stage, it, it's, it's had um, a tick bite it and it has the disease within its body. Jeez. That's... Yeah. There's just, just every time we speak about horses, I feel like they, they're countless ways and for it, us to have handbrakes. And, and it's a difficult thing to get rid of because it can stay in the system for a long time. You can treat them for it. Um, but potentially come summer again and your horse is out in its grass paddock and gets bitten mm. by another tick and it's back into its, its system. Okay. Um, so it is, it's a very, very tricky and difficult thing to, to work with and to get rid of and to make sure that your horse stays pyronegative during its entire trip from Joburg, if it's coming from Joburg to Cape Town, from Cape Town to Mauritius, from Mauritius to Europe <laughs> and Europe onto America. Um, the Americans themselves, they don't really trust anybody's testing. So in theory, you could put your horse on a plane tomorrow and ship it straight off to America. Okay. Uh, no quarantine in South Africa, but it will, would land in America. have to complete a 60-day quarantine when what they call a lockdown quarantine. So they close all the windows and the bowl. In the barn, wow. your horse gets stuck in that barn for 60 days, no exercise. The most they can do is walk up and down the passage. Wow. You're also blocking off that entire barn for any other horse, so it's going to cost you an absolute fortune. Um, I think when I did the maths and I was working it out, it worked out about 50,000 euros, uh, sorry, dollars per horse, uh, based on about 30 oh. horses flying. Oh, so that's that's the bulk discount the bulk is $50,000. 50, that's nuts. It works out to a similar price to going from Joburg to Cape Town, Cape Town to Mauritius, Mauritius to Europe and Europe to America. So it works out to a similar price. Mm. You're obviously cutting out a fair amount of time, um, but there's no guarantees. At least going that route, you can get to Europe, mm. test your horse for pyro, and if it is positive, treat it before sending mm. it across to America. I suppose the quality of life for the horse is also a consideration yeah. at that point. Um, and getting 30 horses to agree on something mm. is not that no. easy. Um, once they've completed that 60-day 60 lock, lock, 60 lockdown quarantine, they do then, um, mares and stallions have to go and do a CEM clearance testing. Um, the stallion, if I'm not mistaken, is a month, uh, let's call it quarantine, but it's at any yard. They just need to do a CEM clearance over there so they can move and they can be free. They can be a, um, normal horses out in the paddock. They just need, need to do that CEM clearance and mares, if I'm not mistaken, is two weeks. Same thing, they move to a separate okay. yard. They can go out in paddocks and all of that. And then galvings can go off. The stallions do have to do a live covering, which puts all the races horses off because while the race horses are currently working and performing, they don't want to distract them mm. with live cover breeding. Um, Very distracting. They've got to go, oh, on, to yeah. go and race afterwards. So it's hard okay. to get that many people together to, to commit. And then the quarantine at JFK, once you book it, you pay for it. There's no turning back. Um, what are, in addition to everything that we've spoken about, what are some of the biggest challenges you face with managing this import and export of horses? What's, what's really holding South Africa back? We've obviously spoken about horse sickness. I mean, we've got free access to a lot of really good horses in Europe. It's not really anything holding us back. Um, challenges that we face is obviously like the testing protocol. Um, Personally, I think if they've done the testing in Europe, just the once when they get here, you can be last of a week. Um, yeah, I can't really think of anything that would mm. really be holding us back in terms of importing. I mean, mm. we're really free to import. If Cape Town opened up, I mean, Ian was talking about the fact that we could argumentatively host the Cape Town Olympics. You know, Theoret have... Theoretically, you mm. could. Um, you obviously need to put measures in place to make sure that um, you'd, you'd want to do it during a winter season. Mm to make sure that there are no cases of horse sickness in the Western Cape or in the, uh, the protected or the free zone that could potentially close us again after that. Um, there are going to be, uh, once we open, different agreements that come into place that are going to be worked on. Absolutely. So our current health protocol with Europe, uh, which has put us off being able to export for so long, is a two-year suspension after every case of horse sickness in the... Two years. Two years, Jeez. on a seasonal disease. 
Okay. So obviously the, the big thing is once we get open again is to change that down to a 60 days after the last reported case or uh, 60, 90 days, something like that, to bring mm. that period down, which obviously means that we can get things rolling again uh, a lot quicker than now. We, we always got to about one year and 11 months before there was another yeah, case. And it was so frustrating. Yeah. So to be able to get that down to a 60 or 90 days, it's, actually it's, imperative. It's, it's vital for us. And then, yeah, potentially Olympics, World Equestrian Games, to set up a nice venue in the Cape, uh, land them there in the winter time. Uh, that obviously reduces our risk. Mm. Um, and Cape Town's not that terrible in the winter. I don't think anywhere in Africa <laughs> is great. Um, but generally, you it's can not, avoid... It's not Germany in the winter. It's not Calm Germany down, in the James. winter. You're going to have a yeah. little bit of rain, so maybe yeah. some wind, but it's not... It's yeah, really, they'll still it's, think it's summer. It's, it's okay. really not a terrible, terrible place to be. James, what is, as a... As a I'm sure juicy for people who are listening, but maybe not for you. What's what's the worst case scenario on one of these flights? Worst case scenario is obviously losing a horse. Um, something that again, touch wood, I've been lucky enough not to not to ever have um, happen, but it's it's a possibility. Um, horses could potentially throw themselves around, and again. Um, if you get there a little bit too late and they're already thrashing themselves around, there's potential that um, the worst can happen. Um, Do you have that something we don't want to speak about or consider doing, obviously, but if, if something happened that a horse completely panicked and you couldn't sedate it enough, what, what do you do? Unfortunately, there's not a lot that you can do. You, um, while a horse is thrashing around, you can't exactly get close enough to give it a lethal injection. If you can get close enough to give it a lethal injection, you can get close enough to sedate it, even if you have to give it a hell of a lot of sedation. And could um, you knock off horse? I mean, it's, again, the other problems that come with that. Like, could you just give it a general anesthetic dose, basically? To... So, if again, if you can get close enough, you can. Um, I mean, you get yourself into a two-birth with a horse That's inside terrifying. there, imagine mm. this mm. horse is now completely throwing itself around and try and get enough sedation into a vein mm. to knock it down enough. And then again, there's the risk that if you've given it too much sedation, you could potentially kill it. So it's six of one, half a dozen of the other. If you can get close enough to give the sedation and sedate it enough that it calms down, um, you also don't want a horse collapsing and falling down. Um, mm. They in, don't do well lying down for 10 hours, I'm sure. No. Okay. So that, that's your worst case scenario. We're touching lots of wood with that, though. Lots of wood. Is there anything else you want to say to anyone who's listening besides go buy a horse in Europe and bring it to South Africa? Go and buy lots of horses. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're here. We try our best. We do everything that we can. Um, I think everyone in the in the import game has everyone's uh, best interests mm. interests at heart. I can put a couple of cases that have happened in the past where horses have been offloaded. I can clearly recall one that got offloaded on the side over here. Not one of my horses, but obviously all the horses arrive at the same time. It was, if I'm not mistaken, a thoroughbred stallion. Um, and it completely freaked out in the truck. Ended up um, getting stuck on the partition oh. with um, his private parts being squashed. I know. I had, unbeknownst to myself, recently broken my back about three oh, months before. Unknown to yourself. Un unknown okay. to myself. As one does, um, you know. And subsequently climbed in underneath him. He was in absolute agony. He was biting at everything that he could. Sure. Um, managed to get into a position. He was, luckily enough, he bumped the pin on the petition at the back open when he did that. And managed to get myself into a position where I could push the partition wide enough open that we could slide him back off. And he was 100% after that. No issues, no problems. Walked off, we gave him sedation, loaded him back up, and he was fine. Jeez. Uh, and then we had one other one. Again, it wasn't one of mine. Um, we had landed the horses and true to Joburg. I think be too exhausted after that flight to do this, but okay. True to Joburg weather, we had an afternoon thunderstorm. The horses were all in oh, the sure. warehouse at uh, Joburg International. And there was a clap of thunder that scared the crap out of all of us. I think it probably struck somewhere at OR Tambo. And this horse got a massive fright. Jumped over the top of the oh. um, pallet. So had the bar at the top of the pallet with both front legs over. Oh, God. Um, and that, I think, took 
a group effort between all of us and probably an hour and a half to get him free. We ended up um, building the front of the pallet up enough with oh, logs and timber that he could actually rest on it, which of course then made him want to climb through the top of I'm the pallet. <laughs> um, so I was inside Solving there, one problem at a time. Inside there trying to get that. We eventually got sure. him off the bar enough that we could open the, the jet stall door enough. The nice thing about those jet stalls, although they go all the way, uh, there's a bar and then two bars that lock in at the top so that you can swing them open. Um, those bars slide down so we could get that out, slide it open again, let him kind of slide off, um, and then backed him up out of there and the, then had to take them out. The engineering off. behind the pallets must actually be quite no, thought out, and it's amazing how they can be strong but collapsible. They are very strong, but exactly that collapsible. So, as I said to you, um, one of the things that um, the guys building the pallets think about is they need to obviously go back. Um, and if they're not going back loaded with cargo, they go back, taking Flat. up less space in the tank. That's amazing. Um, I was going to ask you something else, and it's just gone completely out of my head. I'm sure it was very, very important. James, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Absolutely. That was really fascinating and lovely. And I'll try and get some photos from you maybe, and we can post it onto the SAEF uh, social media feed. Perfect. Fantastic. Let thank me check you. if there were any other questions. No, we're all good. If you are listening to us tonight, thank you for joining us. We've been speaking to James White of Steed Equine Express about shipping horses around the world. Uh, the title of the podcast was Air Horse One. I take full responsibility for that. I apologize. Please meet us here again next Wednesday at 7 o'clock, where we will be continuing our conversations about tracking horses and transports. Thanks for joining.